Bring it over. Well, good evening to each and every one of you. What a joy it is to be able to come to you once again by way of social media, wherever you might be. We want to thank you so very, very much for the pleasure of your company as we gather together here from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America. Uh, we started off this morning with uh, our first open service since we've gone into COVID-19. And I'll tell you what, we had a great time. I don't know how many of you might have participated in it, but we had a great time and we certainly sensed the, the presence of the Lord and it was just great to hear how the people respond, responded. I, one lady went out this morning and she went out and put her hand on her chest and she said, oh my, what joy it is to be in a church service. And uh, other people responded like that. And uh, we didn't have a full house, but we socially distanced appropriately and we had a good turnout, we had a good crowd, and it was fun. And uh, we're going to continue that now each Sunday morning at 1030. And uh, you, uh, you, if you're here in the Altoona area, you can join us. And again, I, I, I tried to stress this this morning, but I want to continue to stress it tonight. And that is that don't feel bad if you don't feel like you're ready to come out yet. Please understand that. Uh, you know, one of the things about um, the, uh, the Baptist church particularly is that we at least do our very best not to put edicts. And uh, we, we give encouragements, we give guidelines, even at the doors when people came in and were asked certain things this morning. If somebody refused, well, then uh, they didn't have to participate. But I, I think that went well as far as what I've been told, the reports I've been given. But so when we talk about opening up the service... Uh, you need to, to feel free and comfortable to come back when you want. And the same thing with other churches. As you know, today there were uh, 14 churches that we know of here in Huntington, Blair, and Bedford County that opened their services. And uh, maybe yours didn't. I don't know. That's, that's okay. But the 14 of us got together and as pastors, and we were, after a lot of discussion and prayer about it, we sensed the leading of the Lord to go ahead and get started, and we did. And it was a great time, and we're going to continue that uh, for, for whatever length of time. And I don't know when we'll get back to Sunday school. I don't know when we'll get back to having an open evening service. I don't know when we'll get back to midweek services uh, being officially opened. But we'll see how the Lord leads. The pastors are going to be meeting again this week. I'm talking about those 14 pastors and uh, talk about that. But like I said, when we officially closed, is that we were officially closed, but we're not turning anybody away. As a matter of fact, tonight, uh, we've got a few people sitting around here looking at me and smiling, and uh, even allowed my parents to come tonight against my own judgment. And, uh, but uh, listen, um, I, guess, uh, I guess I owe them one. But anyway, they're with us tonight and a few others. But uh, we just want to do what we can to see to it that we minister to you wherever you may be. Remember that when we talk about a worship service, one of the elements of that is that it is something we are providing for you to be rendered unto the Lord. That's what we mean when we say service. Something we provide for you that will be rendered unto the Lord, just like you, you go to the, uh, the garage and you pull in and the fellow comes out and says, how much? And you say, fill it up, right? <laughs> how many here remember that? Well, a few. Many of you guys don't. You, you do? You, that's right, up at state college, or up at uh, college. That's right. You did. I forgot about that. They used to uh, pump your gas for you. They used to clean off your windshield. They used to check your oil, check your tires. When I was a little boy growing up, that's what I wanted to grow up to be, was a gas attendant. And now today you, you go and you pump your own gas. 
So that service is something that by and large uh, passed away. Unless you go to uh, Rikert's here in Altoona, the oldest gas station in the United States of America is right here in Altoona. But uh, when we talk about a service, we are talking about something that the church puts on for you, for the people that is to be rendered unto the Lord. And so we will continue with our Sunday morning services uh, open. And then, of course, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we'll come to you virtually. If you sense that you want to come and be a part and sit in a group like we have a few here tonight, you're welcome to do that. And uh, later on, the Lord willing, we'll be back into a full-fledged ministry. And I, I can't wait for that. But in the meantime, we'll continue to come your way, and we are delighted to have you with us, no matter where you might be doing, or where you are, and what you might be doing. Uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we do thank you and praise you for the God that you are. We thank you for the way that you work in our lives, your your wonders to perform. I thank you, Lord, that we were able to get started this morning, along with a number of other churches. Thank you for your presence in this place today. It was a joyful time, and uh, we give you the praise. Now we thank you, Lord, that we can gather tonight for this time of uh, fellowship, singing, worship, praise, and study of your word. I pray that you'll guide us in all that we do. May you be exalted. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pastor Chaz. This evening, we're going to start off by reading from 1 Timothy chapter 5. So I ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Timothy 5. I also ask you to stand out of the respect of the reading of God's Word as we read 1 Timothy 5, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 25. And the Word of God says, I don't know. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge, that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, If she hath relieved the afflicted, if she hath diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee therefore, God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Lay hands suddenly on no man, and neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. 
Thank you very much for the reading of God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Holy Father, I do thank you for the opportunity we had this morning to be together uh, with more, uh, more other, no, no, more, more believers, other believers that haven't been coming the past three or so months. Uh, Lord, we know that that is because of what's going on in the world in this pandemic. But Lord, I do thank you and just see some of the smiling faces as people are coming in and rejoicing to see brothers and sisters in Christ again and uh, the reunion that was happening. And uh, Lord, as, as uh, we don't have that same reunion tonight, we do have, we are still part of the family and we are here to celebrate you. We are here to worship you. Lord, I pray that we would do that. I pray that our focus would be on you. And Lord, that you would be glorified in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I've got to be honest, this morning our congregational singing felt a little bit like heaven. And uh, I don't know about you, but it was just a sweet spirit, especially when we have our own instrumentalists that help us, that assist us, you know, for our congregational singing. But tonight we're going to ask the assistance of Temple Baptist to to rejoin our congregational singing as they're going to lead and help us uh, this evening. The first hymn we're going to be singing is entitled, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. 233, number 233. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. A day I will never forget. How many of you this morning remember the day the Lord Jesus Christ saved you? Amen. Well, let's sing it like we remember it now. 233. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful.
Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor Chaz with our missions moment. Our missionaries of the week are Bill and Ruby Shade with Source of Light Ministries International. And uh, he's got a lot of health issues going on with Bill and Ruby, but uh, a lot of praise items in that health department too. Praise the Lord for health and strength and really uh, focusing on the, the virus, the pandemic that's going around, the coronavirus. So there's still health and strength. Uh, and also, pray, uh, praise the Lord for Ruby's steady recovery from her knee, her knee surgery. And as we speak about Ruby's recovery from knee surgery, also praise God that uh, uh, Bill's carpal tunnel surgery went good and uh, pray for him as he recovers from that. That was this past Thursday. Uh, praise the Lord for Beth's safe return, their daughter uh, from Wyoming. And then the fourth thing you see there is praise the Lord for the security of knowing that Romans 8.28 is good, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And so uh, we have the security of knowing that that is still true. I uh, want to pray for our nation, na- nation and our president, uh, of course, here in Pennsylvania. Pray for our state and our governor and all those that ha- are involved in making any kind of decision. But even here it says pray for wisdom, protection, and another four years. Uh, is, is what they're asking to pray for our president. Uh, pray that our brothers and sisters worldwide who are facing extreme hardship, pray uh, that th- as they are going through this same hardship that we are. Um, and, and if you think of other missionaries as well, they're going through the same hardship. Uh, with churches not being there, maybe the finances aren't coming in to pay the missionaries. And so it, it could be even harder for them than you even think. Uh, but pray for Phil, their son, and the small business people who are hurting. Uh, pray for Steve uh, as he's getting, uh, pray for a successful operation there as well. And then uh, the completion of their apartment project. Of course, we know about that uh, as we've desired to be involved with that as well. But uh, let's go ahead and let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the shades. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the ministry that they have had over these many years. Lord, and the lives that have been changed because of, of, of their, desire, their desire to follow after you. And Lord, we do thank you. We love them. And, and Lord, uh, they are getting up in the age and, and we see there's a lot of operations happening or that have happened. And Lord, we do thank you for how you have worked in both Bill and Ruby's operations and how uh, they were successful and, and they're recovering. And we thank you for that. Lord, uh, there are some more operations uh, com- coming in the future as well as we think of uh, Steve here. And so Lord, I just pray that you be with them in that way. Lord, I do thank you for the leadership that you have given us in this country. And Lord, uh, I do pray that uh, they seek after you. Lord, uh, we know that uh, whoever is the leader, wherever we are, you have appointed. And so, Lord, I just pray that whoever the leader is, to anybody that's watching us, Lord, that they would be praying for their governor, that they would be praying for their president, or whatever else it may be in their country. Lord, I pray that they would be praying that they would seek your wisdom and that they would do what you would want to be done as well. Lord, we do thank you uh, for for the the lives of Bill and Ruby. Lord, I pray that you, as they're even focused on other people around the world, that you would be with uh, those people, whether they be missionaries or Christians that are struggling in other parts of the world. Uh, Lord, that you would bless them and that you would show your strength on them and that they would be able to grow in you. Lord, Help us to follow the example of the shades and continue going on, uh, no matter what the physical ailment might be, but also no matter what the spiritual attack would be as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm going to sing another hymn that encourages us as Christians to be a witness, to be a testimony. I will sing the wonder story of the Christ who died for me. I invite you to stand together as we sing together. And those who are joining us by Media Ministries, sing along with us as we sing this wonderful hymn. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory. Amen, are you ready? Hymn number 300, let's sing as Brother Mark comes and leads us. I will sing the wondrous story I am sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing, yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing and pray, 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 s
Thank you. You may be seated. We're going to ask Ms. Priscilla Ritchie and Lisa Bumgardner to come share with us at this time. That's a complete different rendition of the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Uh, I say that because uh, when we selected the song that we're going to end with tonight, it is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And they asked me about it. I said, no, we're not going to change it. We'll hear it twice. And uh, so that's a different rendition, isn't it? That's called Leading on the Everlasting Arms of God's Great Faithfulness. And uh, so that was good. That was excellent. And uh, I'm ready to hear that one again. But uh, we do thank the Lord and praise the Lord for uh, who He is and uh, how we can lean on Him. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Well, on these Sunday evening sessions when uh, we are going through COVID-19, we are taking a walk through the book of First John. So I would encourage you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 John. And we're going to begin, begin reading in chapter 1 and verse 8. Excuse me, verse, uh, verse 6. And we will go down through chapter 2 and verse 2. 1 John chapter 1 and verse, verse 6. And we'll go down through chapter 2 and verse 2. And I would invite you who are here to stand out of respect for God and His Word as I read and you follow along. One of the things I'd like to ask you to do as we read down through here is to count how much sin is in this passage of Scripture. How much sin is in this passage of Scripture? And uh, what I mean by that is how many times does the word sin appear in this passage of Scripture as I read it, all right? 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6 through chapter 2 and verse 2, where the word of God says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture and what it teaches us about having victory over sin. Now I pray that through your Holy Spirit you would teach us what this passage is talking about, that we might leave this place even more victorious in our Christian life. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Without a doubt, as we look down through this passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, right down through chapter 2 and verse 2, we can say that this is a study, as it were, on hamartiology. Now, somebody might say, well, what is hamartiology? Well, hamartiology is the official term for the study of sin. I don't know of many passages of Scripture in the Word of God where the word sin is mentioned as much as it is in these few verses. And I'm just wondering if anybody here tonight counted how many times the word sin is mentioned in the nine verses that I've read. Anybody figure it out? Yes. Nine. That's right. The word sin is mentioned some nine times in six verses. Nine times in six verses. Which means that we have a teaching here that the Lord really wants us to understand. A teaching that it's very important for us to comprehend and apply to our lives. Now, last Sunday night, we actually looked at verses 7 through 10 and talked about the concept of sin as it is brought up in those verses. Tonight, we're going to focus mainly on verses 1 and 2 of the second chapter, where it says, My little children, these things write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. When we look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, what we see there is the key to victory over sin. The key to victory over sin. You see, before a person comes to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have no victory over sin. They can't overcome sin. They can't overpower sin. Sin, in fact, rules and dominates in their lives. But for those of us who are believers, even though it's true that we will sin, our sin mainly is a choice. It's a choice simply because of the fact that we've yielded to the flesh rather than yielding to the Spirit of God. When we yield to the Spirit of God, He will give us the victory over sin. The Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit that you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, there's a battle going on within us every day of our lives. It's between the flesh or sin and the Spirit or righteousness. And only when we walk in the Spirit are we able to have that victory, but we can have the victory. And walking in the Spirit simply means to say no to sin and self and yes to God's Word. And when we say no to sin and self and yes to God's Word, we're able to have victory in Jesus and victory over sin. No matter what the sin is, we can have victory over it. In fact, as we come into this passage of Scripture, we find that John says, My little children, and remember we mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, that that's a phrase that he uses in talking to believers. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Uh, Probably a more literal translation of this verse would be, My children, these things I write unto you, that you may not sin. That you may not sin. In other words, he's teaching us really here how to overcome sin. And when you read down through this passage of Scripture, you must come to the conclusion, and I want you to get this, you must come to the, to the conclusion that as believers, we should not expect sin in our lives. Now think that through. 
As believers, we should not expect sin in our lives. Are we going to sin daily? Yes. But we shouldn't expect it. You know, we often say that sin should be the exception rather than the rule in our lives, and that's true. But sometimes I kind of think that we fall into sin because we say, well, I'm still in the flesh, I'm still here on earth, I'm still tempted, so I'm going to sin, and and then we let the guard down a little bit. And before you know it, we say something we shouldn't say, we do something we shouldn't do, we think something we shouldn't think, simply because in our own mind, we are expecting to sin, when in reality, the teaching of 1 John is that we should not expect to sin whatsoever at all. And in this passage of Scripture, we have teaching on how we can overcome sin. But before we look at it, I want to share with you a little bit about the words for sin in the Bible. So often when we talk about sin, we think of, well, maybe that is rebellion against God. That's true. But there are other Hebrew and Greek words that are translated for a certain element of sin in the Word of God that sometimes we don't completely understand, and yet each one of them has a distinctive difference. So I want to share them with you briefly tonight as we launch out on this study from 1 John chapter 2. And uh, keep in mind that the study of sin is called hamartiology. And let's look at each one of the words that describe a different element of sin that is in the Word of God. And we're putting these up on the screen so that you can get them and mark them down somewhere in a set of notes or in your Bible. The first word is the word transgression. Transgression. Now, we're not going to study these through in detail. We're not going to look at each one of the verses of Scripture tonight because we would never, we would never get through, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but uh, maybe this is something that you'll want to study through on your own. Well, the word transgression simply means to overstep the boundary, to overstep the boundary. That's found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Mark it, look at it later on. If we were conducting an in-depth study of hamartiology, we would look at it. Another word that relates to a different element of sin is the word iniquity. Iniquity. Uh, That is an act out of line with God's standards. Anytime we do something that is out of line with God's standards, then that's iniquity. Uh, uh, Sometimes that is defined as a wicked act, some sort of a wicked act. Among other places, it's found in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16. A third word that describes a certain element of sin is the word error. Error. Among other places found in Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 6, that means to wander from the right direction. It involves the idea of going one way, which is the right way, and for one reason or another, we get off to the left or we get off to the right. And so we wander from the direction that the Lord would have us to go. The fourth word that describes an aspect of sin is sin. (laughs) We've got to include that when we're looking at it. And sin really is missing the mark of God's holiness. Missing the mark of God's holiness. Uh, Romans chapter 3, 23 is one place where that's mentioned. And of course, we're very familiar with that where it says all have sin and come short of the glory of God. We find it mentioned here nine times in the passage of Scripture that we read tonight. It simply means to miss the mark of God's holiness. Another way to say it would be to miss the mark of God's perfection. God is perfect, without sin. No sin in God whatsoever. But we miss that mark. Uh, Sometimes uh, sin has often been uh, described, or that particular word, sin, has been described as the active or passive rebellion against the will of God. It's missing God's mark of perfection or holiness. The fifth word that relates to a different element of sin is the word wickedness. Wickedness. 
And uh, that's found in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 18. And wickedness is the outworking of the evil nature. <laughs> the outworking of the evil nature. In other words, it is, it is the outworking of who we really are. Uh, when we look out in the world around us to, today, we can see that there's a lot of wickedness. We see that when we read the, the morning newspaper or, or uh, whether it's the paper or the computer or the, the, the television or the radio, however we get our news, we see a lot of wickedness. Well, that's the evil nature coming out of us. I remember when I was a kid growing up, if I did something wrong, my parents were saying, uh, used to say, you're starting to grow horns, I see them. And uh, I remember one time I had some kind of a bump up here, uh, not the bump that I had taken off a couple of years ago. It was another little kind of a boil or something when I was a child growing up. And it was there and it lasted there for a while. And I began to believe that I was growing horns. Because my parents always said, there, you're starting to grow horns. Well, you see, when we talk about wickedness, we are talking about the outworking of the evil nature. The way sin sort of seeps out of our lives in certain actions. There's another word that describes another element of sin, and that's the word evil. Evil, which is that which is uh, wicked, bad, as opposed to God's good. That which is wicked, bad, as opposed to God's good. I mean, when you talk about evil, you're talking about something that is completely the opposite of who God is. And that's found, among other places, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 30. And it's interesting that that is found in that passage of Scripture because when you read down through Romans chapter 1, it talks about those who put God out of their mind, put God out of their thought, put God out of their life. They do that which is evil. And their whole lifestyle is guided by that which is opposed to God's good. The seventh term that describes an elephant, an element of sin is the word ungodly or ungodliness. And that means no fear of God. That's also found in Romans chapter 1. Isn't it interesting that that passage of scripture that talks about the wickedness and the evil of mankind, begins with the word ungodly and ends with the word evil. That's a pretty good description of how bad sin really is. No fear of God is what the word ungodly means. And of course, when a person has no fear of God, they do that which is right in their own eyes. And they continue to go away from God and, and do their own thing. That's not a good thing. Just another term for sin. An eighth specific term for sin, or that goes along with the concept of hemardiology, would be disobedience. Disobedience, again, among other places, found in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6. That means the rejection of God's will. The rejection of God's will. In other words, when we know what God wants us to do, and we don't do it, we are rejecting his will, that is disobedience. And, and might I say that, that partial obedience is complete disobedience. Always remember that. You know, remember the situation in the Old Testament with uh, Saul. Saul was to go in and wipe out all the Amalekites. Remember that story? But he lost his kingdom over it, at least the blessing of his kingdom. Why? Because rather than wiping them all out, he kept the best for the people to take and, in his words, basically, to render to God. Well, he, you see, he, he, he probably wiped out most of them, but he kept the best of what was there. And so he looked at it as mainly partial disobedience, or partial obedience, but it was complete disobedience, and God was not at all happy with him. Disobedience is the rejection of God's will. Then there's the word unbelief. That means to distrust God. Just don't, involves not trusting God, as is brought out in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 58. Another word that describes a sinful condition or, or action is trespass. That's deviating from the right path, deviating from the right path. It's, it's basically a twin of the word error 
But again, it means just uh, going away from the, the direction God would have us to go. And that's found in Colossians 2.13. And then finally, we see that we have the word lawlessness or lawless. And that means rejecting God's law. And among other places, that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. And uh, all sin is lawless. And when we are talking about rejecting God's law, we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. Yes, indeed, that would be involved. But we are talking about God's truth, the perfect law of God. And so whenever we reject God's law and say no to God's law, we are practicing lawlessness. So I, I would encourage you to make sure that you get those down and study them through because unless you understand what those words are, what they mean, you'll never have victory in your life as it relates to sin. Because you might say, well, I'm not doing anything evil, but you might be disobeying. <laughs> or you might say, I'm not, I'm not living in unbelief, but you might be doing something that's lawless. Or you might say, well, I'm not doing iniquity, but yet, uh, you know, you've got some error in your life. You see, it's important to understand those terms so that as we go throughout our Christian life, we see to it that sin really is the exception rather than the rule. Going back to what I said at the beginning of the study, when you read down through 1 John, the point of emphasis is that we should not expect sin in our lives. If we do, thank God... There's forgiveness, but it's not something that we should expect. And the more we understand what it's all about, the more we're going to be able to have victory over it. Well, having said that, let's look at these two verses and see what they teach us about sin. And uh, in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 2, it tells us that Christ is our advocate that gives us the victory over sin. And in verse 2 of 1 John chapter 2, it tells us that Christ is our propitiation that gives us the victory over sin. Look at it again. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, that ye may not sin, as I mentioned earlier. And if any man sin, we, we as believers have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate. That word advocate simply means that the Lord Jesus is our comforter in heaven. Our comforter in heaven. Another word that uh, is used in reference to Christ here is the word our intercessor. We're going to look at that in a moment. But I want you to stop to think about this for a minute. Jesus Christ, as our advocate, is our comforter in heaven. Now, who is our comforter on earth? The Holy Spirit. He is the parakletos, the comforter, the one who is on earth to give us the strength and the victory uh, to live, uh, the strength and the, uh, uh, to live for the Lord and the victory over sin. But not only do we have a comforter on earth in the Holy Spirit, we have a comforter in heaven. That's Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our advocate there. And I know that you're familiar with some of these other passages of Scripture, but let me just bring them out so that you can have more of a broad sense of what we are talking about. Notice Romans chapter 8 and uh, look at verse 34. Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. That tremendous eighth chapter of Romans. There's none like it. It says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of the God, who also maketh what? Intercession for us. That's the same concept as Christ being our advocate. Jesus Christ right now is seated on the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. Jesus is not yet on the throne. He will not be on the throne until the kingdom is established on earth. Right now, he's at the right hand of the throne of God, and there he intercedes for us. And his intercession for us is one of the elements that guarantees our eternal security. 
You know, every now and then you'll run into somebody that says you can lose your salvation. Not if you're, not if you're really saved, you can't lose it. And that's a, that's a study on its own. But I'll tell you, one of the reasons why we know that we can't lose our salvation is because Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is the one who is interceding for us. For instance, go to another verse that I'm sure is very familiar with you, and that is Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Again, talking about the Lord Jesus. It says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, that come unto God by him. And by the way, even that phrase, save them to the uttermost, is a, is a word that indicates that our salvation is eternally secure. The uttermost is eternity. We cannot lose our salvation. But notice the rest of that verse. It says, seeing, in other words, how is it that Christ saves us to the uttermost? Seeing that he ever liveth, that he's, he's always alive. He's living, why? To make intercession for them. Jesus lives to intercede for those of us who are his. And as long as Jesus lives, we will have eternal security. If Jesus died, we would lose our salvation, perhaps. <laughs> there ain't no perhaps about it. We would. Now, is Jesus going to die? No. He'll live forever, and because he lives forever, he is living to make intercession for those of us who know him. Therefore, there's no way that we can lose our salvation. Boy, you know, I'm, 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 debate, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to get on a, a rabbit trail here, uh, but I'm not going to get on it. But the whole concept of eternal security is so significant for us to understand. And the reality of it is, once we are saved, we are always saved. Why? Because we don't save ourselves, and neither do we keep ourselves. We're saved by the grace of God, and we're kept by the grace of God, and Jesus lives forever to intercede for us. And as long as he lives, we have eternal security, and he will never die again, so we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And so you see, as it relates to this concept of Jesus Christ as our advocate, it's a good thing for us. Now, it's interesting to note that among the different titles that Satan has is that he is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 says that. And it's the idea that Satan is before God the Father accusing us. Accusing us of any sin that we might commit. Accusing us of unbelief. When we would stumble and fall into sin, you know, in a sense, it's though Satan would be there before the throne of God in heaven saying, God, there is that Gary Dahl. You see what he's doing? And, and he accuses me to the nth degree. And by the way, he accuses us all before God the Father. Yeah, let me just pause here and say, you know one of the reasons why we should not be going around judging and accusing others? Satan does it already. And when we are doing it, we're doing his work. You remember that. The next time you go around judging and accusing others, you're doing the devil's work. <laughs> That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. But perhaps even right now, up yonder in heaven, we find that Satan is there accusing us before God of something. But we have an advocate. And Jesus Christ being our advocate doesn't mean that he is standing there before God fighting the devil. I mean, I don't know what goes through your mind when you think of the fact of Jesus being an advocate. <laughs> It's not that uh, the devil says something and then Jesus says something else and then the devil says something. And then There's not a big debate going on up there. That's not the emphasis behind this at all. What's behind it is that the work of Jesus Christ is already finished. Amen? When he died on the cross, he said what? It is finished. The redemptive work is done. 
You and I have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. We have salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We stand before God through Jesus Christ. We stand in the righteousness of Christ. Our life is hid with Christ in God. I mean, you know, it's all because of Jesus that we have eternal life. So Jesus is not up there in heaven debating the devil before the Father. Christ's very presence before the Father is our advocate. The very fact that Jesus is before the Father seated at his right, the right hand of his throne. And by virtue of the fact that our righteousness is in Christ, by virtue of the fact that we are in Christ, any time that Satan accuses us, the Father remembers that we are cleansed from our sin in Christ. And that doesn't give us the excuse to sin. But it sure does talk a lot about God's grace. Let's put it this way. I want you to look at me, and if you're watching by the media, you can look at me too. I mentioned this morning that uh, I said to somebody today when we had service that... um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad to see you. I haven't seen you in almost three months. And, and the person responded by saying, well, I, I see you every week watching on that thing. And I said, that's not fair. <laughs> you see me, but I don't get to see you. Well, look at me here for a minute. Jesus is our advocate. I want you to get this. When Satan points his bony finger at us, as it were, before Almighty God, the Father. God the Father just points to Jesus and basically is saying to Satan, you got nothing to accuse. Now get that. Get that. Christ isn't up there battling Satan. But when Christ... But when Satan stands before God to accuse us and he begins to point his bony finger at us, God the Father just says, Satan, look at Jesus. The work's done. Redemption is over. The blood is shed. Christ is alive. And no matter what you do to accuse whoever, that person is righteous in Christ. Aren't you thankful that we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ the righteous? And as long as he is there as our advocate, we'll never lose our salvation. Because he's interceding for us all the time. And that's a key in overcoming sin. Well, we see that Jesus Christ is our advocate. Now, go down to verse 2. He not only is our advocate, but he is, verse 2 says, he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, this is a verse that would preach too. (laughs) But that word propitiation means payment. Payment. The wages of sin is death. Doesn't the Bible say that? All have sinned and have come short to the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The price to pay for sin is is death, but the gift of God is Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, when he died on the cross of Calvary, paid the wage of sin for you and for me. And that payment fully satisfied the Father. The Father didn't say there's more that's needed. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross fully, completely satisfied the work of the Father in the payment that was given. You see, when you come across a person who says they must work to gain their salvation or they must work to keep their salvation, they are forgetting the work of Christ as the propitiation for us. 
We cannot, say, we cannot work to save ourselves because there's no more of a price that needs to be paid. The price has already been paid. And we don't need the work to keep ourselves because the price has already been paid. The price has been paid in Jesus Christ's death on the cross and the Father was fully satisfied to that. The work of Christ on the cross fully satisfied the demands of a righteous God. And consequently, we can't work for our salvation. We can't work to keep it because it's all settled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. But it's not only the propitiation for those of us, but for the sins of the whole world. And um, I just have to mention this before we go any further. Because, you know, there, there's a teaching out there that Christ died just for the elect. You've heard it? He's just died for the elect. The certain few. That is a lie. From the pit of hell. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish but have everlasting life. And right here. You know if you say that Jesus Christ only died. If you say that Jesus Christ only died. For the elect whoever they may be. You are writing this verse right out of your Bible. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, all of humanity. Christ died on the cross for everybody in the world. And that's why we're involved with missions. That's why we evangelize. Because that person down the street who's living the wicked life, Jesus died for him or her. That person out there in, in Kenya, India, France, Ecuador, wherever. Sometimes we talk about the heathen. Jesus Christ died for them. And by the way, the heathen aren't just in third world countries up in the jungle. The heathens live right in the major cities of the United States of America on Wall Street. Now, don't go home and t- say that I've said that everybody in Wall Street's a heathen. I didn't say that. But I am saying that everywhere there's people, there are heathens, because heathens are those who reject Christ. We don't have to go to another country to find them. You were a heathen once, before you came to Christ. So was I. But the point of it is, Christ died for the whole world. Never forget it. And if you come up against somebody that said he just died for the elect, take them back to this verse, and if they begin to argue over that, Just close your Bible, don't argue, close your Bible, walk away from them, and don't give them any more time. That's the best way to handle false teaching, just walk away from it. They won't listen to you, just walk away from it. Let the Spirit of God work in their lives. You know, there have been times in my life where situations that have come up, and I I really wanted to argue, and I, I I can be argumentative if I wanted to be. But there are times when things have come up and I just wanted to say something. You know how that is? <laughs> no, we're wearing masks, a lot of us, these days. And sometimes I just want to put a mask on me and argue. And sometimes I have stumbled and argued. But you know, one of the things I've learned that I need to do more is that particularly when it comes to arguing the truth of the Word of God, If there is somebody who's denying that truth, rather than trying to debate them, just place them into the hands of God. And say, God, you take care of them. You take care of them. You teach them. You deal with them. Whatever is the case. And God will do a much better job with them than I will. (laughs) But uh, thank the Lord that he died, Christ died for the whole world. Never, never, never forget that. Now, we've talked about the fact here that Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He's before the throne of God making intercession for us, our comforter in heaven. We talked about the fact that he is the propitiation for our sins. That simply means he is the ultimate payment for all of our sins. 
I want you to follow this. Because of the fact that Jesus Christ is our advocate, and because of the fact that he is our propitiation, you and I who are Christians have victory over sin. Remember my definition of salvation? Can anybody here say my definition of salvation? If you can't say it, I'm going to go home and cry tonight. Because I say it almost every Sunday. The Bible says we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which is, means... Blank screen. You can't even get me in that shot, can you? Ah, uh, you rascals. Hello. It is what? The, what's the next word? I say it almost every Sunday. The deliverance of sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard that before? couple of times, yeah, about every Sunday morning I say it. Sin, sal salvation is the deliverance from sin. It's power, it's penalty, and it's presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Got it? Because Jesus is our advocate in heaven and because Jesus Christ is our propitiation, we have victory over sin, power, penalty, and presence. Every bit of it even now in this life. So often we talk about the fact that we will have ultimate victory when we see Jesus Christ face to face, and that's true. But right now, right now, where we are right now on earth, you and I as Christians can have victory over every little sin, and it's because of the fact that Christ is our advocate and our propitiation. He is the one who gives us the victory to the point that we don't need to yield to sin. The unsaved person can help but yield to sin. But you and I don't need to because of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf as advocate and propitiation. You say, how does that work? Well, first of all, before I show you how it works, let me just give you some scriptures to take into consideration. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, this is, and we're about to, running towards the end of the message. But what I'm getting into tonight is the content of the, the ultimate content of my message tonight, the ultimate purpose of my message. But so let's follow this a little bit. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse uh, 3. Now, I've said many times over again that 1 Corinthians 15 is the blank chapter, right? The what chapter? Resurrection chapter. Somebody knows that. Thank the Lord. All right, and we just talked about that during Easter. Well, it is the resurrection chapter. And notice what it says in verse 3. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Let's remember, He died for all of our sins, all right? So that we can have victory over the power, the penalty, and the presence of sin. He died for all of our sins. There's not one sin He did not die for, all right? Keep that in mind and go to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. And I want to read verse 3. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might what? What's the next word? Deliver us. From the present evil world, which is talking about the wicked world that's around us. That world system that's diametrically opposed to God. He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God the Father. Christ died for our sins to deliver us from the world. From the wickedness, from the sinfulness, from the sin of the world. He died to deliver us. Salvation is the deliverance from sin. It's power, it's penalty, and it's presence through faith in Jesus Christ. Through Christ's death on the cross, and then, of course, his resurrection, you and I have victory over sin. 
Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And notice verse 24. 1 Peter 2, 24, as it's talking about the work of Christ on our behalf. It says, who his own self bear our sins, sins, every one of our sins, in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, you're dead to sins. How many of you are alive tonight? Everybody here raised their hands. How about you folks? Yeah, okay, I see you back there, Josh. Everybody is alive. When you die, what are you not going to do? You're not going to breathe, humanly speaking, on earth. I'm talking about our earthly death now. You won't come to church anymore. You won't talk. You won't look. You won't hear. You won't see as it relates to the physical, right? In heaven, sure, you'll be enjoying those things, but I'm talking about the physical now. When you're dead, you won't get in your car and drive home. You know, when you're dead, you're not going to drive to your own funeral. Nor will you drive yourself to the gravesite. You just don't do that. You can't do it because you're separated from physical activity, Right? Positionally, in Christ, we are dead to sins so that we can live righteously unto him who healed us with his stripes. Gave that spiritual and physical healing through his, through the, through his work on the cross. When we trusted Christ, you see, before we are saved, we are dead in trespasses and sins, Right? Are you with me? Say amen. Which means we can't please God. After we come to Christ, we are dead to sin. Right? That's what the Bible says. Turn to the book of Colossians chapter 3. This is really a study in ham audiology, and I trust I'm not feeding you with a fire hydrant tonight. But go to Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. How many of you are dead tonight? One. Two. You're dead unto sin. You see it? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. Are you with me? Follow this. Before we are saved, we are dead in trespasses and sins. After we come to Christ, we are alive in Christ and dead to sin. Therefore, sin does not have to rule in our lives. We are delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. I feel like preaching tonight. I'm going to try. Anytime we sin, it's because we're giving in to it. We're not allowing the Spirit of God to control us. That's why I said at the beginning of the message that you and I should live the kind of a life where we don't expect to sin. We shouldn't expect to tell a lie. We shouldn't expect to stretch the truth. We shouldn't expect to have an evil thought. We shouldn't expect whatever. But we should so be walking in the Spirit of God that sin is the real exception rather than the rule. Are you with me tonight? You say, prove it. Okay, can I borrow a few more minutes off of you? I'll prove it. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And this is all because of the fact that Jesus is our advocate and our propitiation. He's our comforter before the Father and he ever lives to make intercession for us. He paid the full price of sin on the cross for us. Go to Romans chapter 6. We don't have the time to delve into this in detail tonight, but let me just highlight a few verses. Of course, verse 1 starts off by saying, What shall we sin? What shall we say then? Shall we 
uh, continue in sin that grace may abound. You know, uh, there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm under grace so I can live any way that I want. You know, there is that ultimate grace movement. Thank God for the grace of God. Amen. And God's grace is in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. But there's a teaching out there that says, now that I'm saved I'm in, and I'm in grace, I can live any way I want. That's not Bible. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What are those next two words? God forbid. <laughs> How shall we that are, what? Dead to sin live any longer there? In. Now, go down to verse 6. Notice it says, knowing this, that our old man, I'm not talking about my dad. Boy, that was one word, one phrase I could never use. My dad told me one day if I ever called him the old man, that would be the last time I ever spoke. I don't know what to call him when he's 88. The elder one. Well, this is not talking about our dads. <laughs> This is talking about the old sinful flesh, the old nature that we have. Are you with me? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, the body of sin is the same as the old man. It's the flesh. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That word destroyed means to be rendered inoperative. Now watch this. You and I are alive and sin is all around us. We still have the sin nature. Our sin nature is not completely eradicated until we see Jesus Christ, right? It's there fighting us every day. But in Christ, for those of us who are believers, it's rendered inoperative. That's what that word destroyed means. Rendered inoperative. Which means if we don't want to, if we don't allow it, it's not going to operate in us. Not that it's eradicated. But we've got victory over it, it because Christ is our propitiation and our advocate. If we say yes to the Spirit of God and no to sin and self, we can overcome any and all sin. Sin is not to be expected in our lives. We just need to learn to be biblical a little bit. I can almost sense in the other side of that camera... People are asking all sorts of questions, and maybe they're good ones and bad ones. I don't know, but my challenge is get into the Word of God for crying out loud. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should what? Say it. Not serve sin. Hey, we are dead unto sin and alive unto Christ. Why should we serve it? Why should we yield to it? Why should we go along with it? Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. I'm free, I'm free. Thank God Almighty, I'm free indeed. Did you ever hear that before, Connor? Who stated that? You're not sure. I think it was Martin Luther King, wasn't it? Years ago said that. But as believers, we can say, I'm free indeed. I don't have to yield to sin. Attitude, action, or activity. Why? Because Jesus is the propitiation for my sin. Jesus is my advocate in heaven. And I've got victory over it through Christ. We just need to apply it. Say no to sin and self and yes to the Spirit of God. Wish I could preach tonight. Go down to verse 11. It says, likewise, uh, let me read verses 8 and following. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God likewise, because Christ has, uh, the, the death has no more dominion over sin because of that. Reckon. Did you ever hear the word reckon? You used to hear it a lot in western Pennsylvania. Somebody said, are you going to go to church tonight? I reckon. <laughs> well, what are you saying there when you say you reckon? Well, the word reckon here, at least in the Bible, means that which is an absolute fact. That which is an absolute fact. So if you say, somebody says to you, are you going to church tonight? You say, I reckon. That doesn't mean you might not go. That means what? You're going to go if you're going to be true to the word. 
At least this Greek word that's translated reckon. Likewise, reckon yourself, recognizing that it's an absolute fact. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. We don't need to let sin work in us, whether it's attitude, action, or activity. We don't need to yield to that. The unsaved person cannot say no to sin. But you and I can because of the Spirit of God who dwells in us. Walk in the Spirit and ye shall what? Not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let not, don't let it reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Your members talking about everything that you are. Don't yield any aspect of your life unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What he is saying is don't give your body, don't give your life, don't give your instruments, don't give what you are to sin, give what you are to Jesus. Give what you are to righteous living. Who are you yielding to tonight? The world, the flesh, and the devil, and self? Or to God? Choice is yours if you're saved. Yield unto God. Verse 14 For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under the grace. You see, under law, there was no victory over sin. You you, you know what the law really did? It revealed sin. Go to Romans chapter 7, verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. You see, it's the law, the Old Testament law that was given, that really revealed to mankind the sinfulness of mankind. The Ten Commandments doesn't save us. The Ten Commandments shows us that we're sinners. So the law doesn't save. It wasn't intended to do that. The law shows us our sinfulness... And our wickedness. And he says, you're not under the law. You can't overcome sin under the law. But you, today, as a Christian, you are under what? Grace. Grace. You see, back in the Old Testament, they had to try to overcome sin on their own. And that's why they failed, 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 failed. You and I today, because of God's grace in our life, are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And He's at work in our lives day by day and with each passing moment to give us the victory over sin. Uh, Because of God's grace, God has saved us. And He says, now I'm going to equip you to overcome sin. Don't resist Him. Let the Spirit of God do His work in your life and my life. And the victory is ours. Sin was revealed through the law, but truth came by grace. Salvation came by grace. It goes on to say, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? No, 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 no. God forbid. And here it is. You might want to circle, underline, mark, highlight... Verses 16, 17, and 18, then we'll go home. And I know some of you are already home. So what are you complaining about the length of the service for? You're already there. You're probably eating cookies, Cracker Jacks, Snickers, popcorn. You're watching the movie, aren't you? Look at this. This is what it's all about. Know ye not, don't you know, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You and I can decide who we're going to serve. Is it going to be sin or righteousness? Is it going to be the world, the flesh, and the devil? Or the Lord Jesus. The choice is ours as believers. Unsaved don't have that choice. You and I do. Who are you yielding to tonight in your attitudes? 
Who are you yielding tonight in your activities and actions? Don't yield to sin. Because when you yield to sin, you're obeying sin. When you yield to God, you're obeying God. Who are you yielding to tonight? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. That's what every unsaved person is. And before you and I were saved, we were servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. What form of doctrine? The form of doctrine being the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that through faith in Christ we have life eternal, life abundant, and victory over sin. I need to hear a hallelujah. Oh, that's all right. (laughs) The form of doctrine is the fact that through faith in Jesus Christ, we are saved and have the deliverance of sin from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And therefore, verse 18 goes on to say, Being then made free from sin, ye become the servants of righteousness. We are free from sin through faith in Christ, and as we don't yield to sin, and we can make that choice, as we choose not to yield to sin, the Spirit of God will go to work in our our lives and gives us the strength to yield to righteousness, and therefore we don't need to expect to sin. Sin will really be the exception rather than rule in our lives and we'll have victory over sin I don't know about you but I'm getting worn out tonight I said all that the last how long has this sermon been going on really Has it really been going on for 60 minutes? That's all right with me. Hey, I'm the one who's been standing here all night. I said all that to say this. If you're saved, you have a living Savior who's the propitiation for your sin. He paid the price for your sin on the cross. And right now, as your advocate... He sits before Almighty God, the Father. And when Satan comes along to accuse you, God the Father just says, look at my son, Gary Dahl is in Christ. Salvation's complete. Satan has no, nothing, no foundation upon which to accuse us. He tries, but he can't. Now, for the believer... There is no excuse to sin. Some people say, now that I've got eternal security, I can live any way that I want. Or now that I'm in the flesh, I can sin every now and then, it's okay. No, there's never any excuse. And certainly we are going to sin, aren't we? But we should make certain in our lives that we so yield to the Spirit of God that sin is the exception rather than the rule. Now let's go back to 1 John and then we'll go home. I said that a little bit ago, didn't I? But we will. I didn't say when. I said we will. 1 John, verse 8 of chapter 1. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember that sin we talked about last Sunday night is imputed sin and transmitted sin. Remember that? We talked about that. We all have sin. Verse 10 says, if we say that we have sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Are we going to sin? Yeah. Thank God for verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do have the the wherewithal to be victorious over every sin. But when we sin and we go to God and confess that sin and agree with him that we've wronged him, he is faithful to forgive us and just because of the work of Christ to cleanse us from our sin and all unrighteousness. I don't know 
But isn't that great? thing of it is, we don't even need to yield to it. You've got the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. The Spirit of God is in you to give you the victory over sin. Because we have a propitiation. We have an advocate. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you tonight to call upon the name of the Lord and ask Him to save you. And He will. And He will deliver you from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Christ alone. And if you trust Jesus Christ as Savior, I'd encourage you to let us know here, and we'll send you a book that will help you to get started right in your Christian life. In the meantime, as a Christian, stay in God's Word. Determine you're going to yield to the Lord and the Spirit of God. And sin really will become the exception rather than the rule in your life, not because of your power. Uh Uh-uh. Uh-uh. But because of the power of the Spirit of God who's in you. Victory in Jesus. Amen. Let's stand in prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you tonight, we do thank you and praise you for the privilege of being able to call you our Father. We thank you so much for your faithfulness to us in giving us victory over sin. Oh, how we love you. I pray, Lord, that you'll take this preaching tonight, this teaching, and clarify it in each of our minds. And if there is any misunderstanding, I pray that your spirit will clear it up and lead us to that point of understanding. And if we simply say yes to you and no to sin and self, that we'll have victory in Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen. Mr. Mike. We'll close this hours of this hour of worship and learning by singing a great hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father. And with all of your heart, let's sing it. Sing it like you were singing it right in the very presence of God and sing it to the Lord. Hymn number four, where the Lord comes to lead us to your best. Great is thy faithfulness.
it's been a great day, and I'm so thankful that we were able to get together with a lot of our friends and brothers and sisters in Christ this morning and tonight by virtual ministry. We remind you that next Sunday at nine at ten thirty we'll be here again live. You're all welcome. If you don't feel up to coming because of COVID nineteen, we understand that, and um, that's fine. But we'll be here if you choose to come. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this uh, this uh, this evening, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight. For those who joined us, I pray that you'll take this last hour and a half and use it in our lives for your glory. Dismiss us from this service. Use us for your, your good. May we honor you in everything that we do and say this week. May we be the witnesses that you'd have us to be and want us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's children said,